Hello, my name is J.R. Rodriguez, and welcome to another One Man Band podcast. Today, we're going to talk about uh, The Rebel Without a Crew, the book. Absolutely. The, the book that changed my life. Yeah. Today, we have Mark uh, here uh, uh, to discuss, to have a discussion about the book. Thanks yeah. to Mark. Mark bought me the book just recently because oh. I just... Uh, been wanting to uh, go over the book again, relive that experience again yeah. of, of reading the book. And it has been a lot of fun. It's been inspiring. Never mind, I just saw Elizabeth and Robert like two weekends ago at the screening for the faculty. They did a whole little Q&A afterwards. Oh, really? Okay, I didn't so, know yeah. about that. And I hadn't, been, cool. I hadn't been to one of those in but, uh, yeah, how fucking how years and shit. Yeah. After I had now, you had a copy of this book uh, years ago, probably yeah, I mean, a hardcover I, version. I of had it. a hardcover copy, and I saw now they're going for like 70 bucks. Yeah, I know. That's why when I was, <laughs> I, I looked into getting a, a hardcover edition. I was like, There was uh, one I found for like 30 it. bucks, but I wasn't going to ask you to spend 30 bucks on a book. Yeah. This, this, this is all I needed. You know? sure. In fact, when I'm done reading it, I'm going to pass it to him, and that's what people should do is, you know, get the information and pass it on i think this one is like a second or third edition or even more and it, it has extra stuff in there i think yeah like my original, copy release. didn't i don't believe my copy uh had a copy of the script in it right you know and they, they added a couple of sections to the appendix of it i guess which includes the script and i guess the 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 10 rules of filmmaking or something that Yes. I don't know if that, that was in the that original. That, I believe, not. was in the original, oh, okay. I think. Okay. All right. So one thing that I want to get across in this podcast is that I'm lobbying hard, Robert, make this into a miniseries. There's so many people that don't know the story. Um, they uh, did not read the book because the book is like 25 years Something like twenty five years old or something like that, you I'm know? I'm not sure when they when he actually so, wrote it. I mean, obviously there's a diary that this is based upon. Exactly. Least. So the book starts with him as a little kid, um, uh, going his first experiences was his mom taking him to the local theater and right. watching like all those classic double, old movies. Like double features, like right. and she would even like uh, let them stay and watch it twice sometimes because <laughs> it was just a way to kind of, I guess, get out the house and right uh, under air conditioning. Exactly. Like, yes. The book talks about her like packing food and stuff and sneaking it into oh, the theaters. Oh, of course, sure. Right? Um, Movie viewing on the cheap. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that for his network, for his El Rey network, he should do a mini series and just. You know, the content is all here, man. Like, uh, it's too much, I feel, to be made into one movie. You're not going to do it justice. I mean, you could, but you would have you to won't do it justice. so many you details. You won't do it justice, right. you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. Where a miniseries, it would rock, and it would be so El Rey Network, you know? Because it's, it's Robert, you know? It's yeah. Robert. It's his first... Um, it's how he first learned how to make movies using his siblings and how his dad bought a VCR and he confiscated it and <laughs> right. he tried making little little uh, figure animation oh, stuff. Oh, that's right, like claymation type Claymation, stuff, huh? that didn't work because of the glitches. And right. for me, that would be fascinating and use his family because, I mean, he used his son in his last movie, Red 11. His son oh. played him, mm -hmm. uh, the character from... The, the pharmacal uh, um, drug studies. Oh, that's right. That was his. Uh, that was his name when he was doing the studies. He was wearing. I didn't. I didn't know that until I read it. Team, and he was number eleven of the you know, red team. I've been right? trying to figure out what does red eleven mean. You know, is it is it one of the pills, one of the drugs they had to take? And it, and then when I read it in the book, it was like, ah, oh, his name yeah. was red eleven. That's <laughs> there you go. Right. So. It's the book that keeps on giving, right? <laughs> right. There's so many details in there, and then he, he he references them in his later work, obviously. So when he was a child, can be one stage of 
the series, you know? Yeah. And, man, that can cover quite a few episodes, you know? And be, then yeah. when he becomes a teenager and he goes to high school, how he started um, drawing, like, in the corners, like stick figure animation right. using the pages. I remember and, doing that with, like, little notepads and stuff. Yeah. We would do that sometimes. So, he would do that. He would be allowed to turn in like a video instead of an essay. Like an essay, a video version of whatever his essay would be. And, you know, just things like this. So That's pretty amazing. He had such forward-thinking teachers in high school at that time. So. Started doing comic strips, you know, when he got into college. Um, right, yeah. What was that called? The Hooligans Los or something? Los Hooligans. Mm -hmm. Yeah. His first production company was called Los Hooligans. And Which is a yeah, reference back to his comic strip days. So that's cool. Then how he met Carlos, the guy who plays the mariachi in the movie. He was friends with him mm -hmm. because he went to a private school across the street from where he lived. Right. And they became friends. And then he would go to Acuna and spend time with him during the summers. And they would run around Acuna and make... Uh, Wow. Little little short movies. and I mean, for me, for people to think that, oh, he went to the, the Pharmaco and he wrote his first script, right? Which I believe it was his first script, but first it wasn't the first script, I yeah, guess. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then went and did El Mariachi in Mexico and it became huge. It's, it's not the full story. Mm-mm. So many years before that, he was that was the filmmaker filmmaker in making. Since he, he was is, a kid, he is the luckiest guy in the world. And when I say luck, I mean luck in the sense that luck is when preparation meets opportunity. Yeah. Because then all these opportunities just present itself. Dizzy wanted to talk to him. TriStar wanted to talk to him. Paramount wanted to talk to him, right? Oh, yeah, Disney. And they're all okay. throwing different opportunities at him. And he's like, oh, yeah, I can do that. Oh, yeah, I, I, I can do that too. <laughs> That's because he prepared himself. He's not like a, yeah. a one-trick pony. He just did that one thing. He had built up to that point. He didn't need film school because all his preparation that he did all those years was his film school. This you is know? true. I mean, even though he did have a short stint at UT Film School, and, and did he the, did one one film uh, at UT? Right. He did Bedhead. One student which, film. Right. No, no. True. Bedhead was something he did on his own, and he funded it with, again, um, oh. a smaller drug study at Pharmaco. Okay. Okay. And that okay. he did on his own. I stand corrected. The the project that they did for the student film was something that he did with the other class. So yeah, so his story is fascinating, but to just tell it from there is not doing service. You're right. And not only that, you know, the other thing that he's lucky too is that he had both his parents. He had parents that um, were there for him. They were very supportive. Very supportive, mm -hmm. you know, and that's another aspect of the story that needs to be told. You know, like, we need to see examples of people who were successful and seeing that that nucleus, that family nucleus that they grew up under was what helped them to become such a, a positive and creative human being to the point where right. he became, he's, he's, he not became, he is this unstoppable force. But you were talking about his family being very supportive. And stuff. Yes. He had a huge family. How many brothers? Did, he had like nine brothers, brothers ten, and I sisters. I think it was 10 total, yeah, ten, something like that. So, wow. And so, yeah, he came from a big family. And he used a lot of his family in some of the films he made. Yeah, you like know, at an early age. Early age, that's what he did. I would love to see, like, you know, he still has copies of those things. Oh, you know? that would be awesome. Yeah. He had a big compendium of everything that he did from as early on. as Showing that aspect of it, you know, uh, the family. Um, and then... Have you seen Bedhead on YouTube? Yeah. It's pretty much all his family, all the cast. Yeah. Probably most of the crew. If they're, you know, yeah. So, that's... Pretty interesting to have that kind of a support. 
mechanism, yeah. you know. So I would love to see a recreation of how all that happened and let it just like go through, um, you know, the UT, you know, all the stuff that happened at UT, the Pharmaco experience. I mean, right. he made a little movie, um, Red 11, based on that. But hmm. I would like to see like an actual recreation of how things like accurate how things happen, you know? Ah, yeah. Like how he has it in the book, you know? How he um, got everything together. Uh, just just do it, baby. Just do the whole thing and let's see it. Right. Let's see how he how he looked, how he behaved. When it is one thing to read it, but then, you know, when you act it out and you can see a visual, you know, uh, uh, yeah, I think that'd be a reenactment of it. Yeah, it'd be a pretty inspirational. Yeah, he could probably have mini series. He could probably have his son play a young version of him. Yeah, because his son that. now is twenty one years old, the age that he was when he made El Mariachi. I mean, imagine huh, what kind of experience perfect. that would be for his son to play his dad in one of the most historic uh, films of his dad's career, which is El Mariachi. Yeah, that's true. I mean that 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 is a, a game changer. When he came out with that movie, a game changed. Oh, I remember wow. when I was working in my dad's store. Mm -hmm. We would watch the news right before the the numbers. So he would have a little TV in his auto parts store at the corner uh -huh. of the counter, and so that he would never miss the daily numbers because he would he would play like. Sometimes like a thousand dollars a day in numbers, and he collect Whoa. and he okay. collected numbers too. So, oh, okay. um, and but he was very obsessed with the with the numbers. So he always had the TV, and you couldn't change the channel. It had to stay on that channel. God forbid, really? <laughs> the number came on and we missed it. He would have a fit. Okay. So we would all be like, oh, it's almost time. Like, hey, okay. Okay. It's like the lottery, right? Almost time. Yeah, it's a okay. three three digit number is the, the thing. Okay. okay. The daily number. Got it. And so one day it came over the news that um mm -hmm. I forget how it went. It says something like, Do you think that uh a filmmaker can make a movie with seven thousand dollars, no crew? and win the Sundance Film Festival Audience Award. Something like that. Or, <laughs> okay. and, and land a big, on. a big Hollywood contract. 1991, Columbia Pictures introduced you to an extraordinary new filmmaker and an unforgettable new vision. The director was 23-year-old John Singleton. The film, Boys in the Hood. Now, Columbia Pictures is proud to present a remarkable new film from another extraordinary new talent. The director is 23-year-old Robert Rodriguez. The film, El Mariachi. Uh -huh. You know, they, they built it up like that, and it was like, well, right. yes. And they mentioned, they showed Robert with uh, a digital camera, mm -hmm. not not that badass film camera, whatever he's right, got the, there. The Aer it was like an Aeroflex 16 millimeter, something yeah. like that, yeah. And I remember they showed the trailer. The trailer that he talks about in the book that everybody flips out when they see it, mm -hmm. you know, it's very John Woo like, you know. Yeah, that's what people told him later. So. It was fast, you know, fast paced. Right. I mean, when I saw it, I remember when I saw it for the first time, right? It just it, it shocked me. It it because I had been talking about wanting to make movies. Mm -hmm. I didn't finish. I didn't graduate from high school. I dropped out of high school. Mm -hmm. I really wasn't a writer. I didn't read. You know, the first book I ever read was this book. So thank you for inspiring me to read, because until yeah. you broke out with this book, I, I gave, I didn't give a shit about reading books. You know, right. I just I didn't, and so I wasn't a good writer. I had poor vocabulary, um, and so when I when I saw the news, I like felt like wow. And his name is Rodriguez too. You know, mm -hmm. It was like right. so, so weird. Uh, like he's Rodriguez. He mm -hmm. looked like he was about my age, and I was like, "Jesus Sounds Christ! Right. Yeah. This guy, he stole my thunder." <laughs> <laughs> I was like, "He beat me to it." 
I was going to do that. How I was, dare he? My dad at that point <laughs> had a video camera for a while. Mm -hmm. I could never use it. I was not allowed to use it. He was very protective and really jealous of that camera. I think he paid a pretty penny for it. And it was oh, one of the first. So, you know. And all he ever did with it was watch uh, movies on it. Oh. Just, and the same movies, too. He would watch Charles Brownson movies, Fistful of Dollars, Clint Eastwood movies. That was it. On the camera? Over No, because the camera came with a deck. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Really, the deck came with a camera. Let me, let me reverse that. Okay. Yeah, you didn't. You really weren't buying the camera. You were buying the deck that mm -hmm. came with a camera, and it was uh, tied to a cord. Okay. Like a 10-foot, so 12-foot cord. That was back in the day when you didn't put the tape in the camera. You put Man, the tape in the deck you, connected to the camera. Yeah, that, right. deck, that deck was amazing. Mm -hmm. You could do audio and video inserting. I mean, okay. it was professional, professional, top-of-the-line deck. And it was portable. It was, mm -hmm. you know, it had batteries on it, you know. Even that was something new. Um, uh, but he never used it. I think he huh. wanted to make movies. And I wish, I wish to God that he would have been like, hey, boy, come on, let's go make some movies. Because. Yeah, that would have been cool. My dad was my hero, you know. Uh -huh. Like, my dad was a legit, like, Charles Bronson type dude that. He's a tough guy. Oh, uh, he was, he was, he didn't take shit from anybody. I, uh, I decided, let me then now uh, play catch up. Right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I said to myself, from here on out. I am no longer, I mean, to the point where I couldn't work with my dad anymore because the fact that he had a camera and he wouldn't let me use it and I'm working for him, right. like, you know, almost seven days a week, I was living with him. I had no life outside of that fucking store, mm. you know? Mm -hmm. And it really, it meant nothing to him, you know? Yeah. And I was like, you know what? I got to get out of this situation because I'm never going to afford to buy my own camera and my mm. dad isn't going to let me use his camera. Why even work for him? Mm. You know? Wow, okay. So I left, you know, and Man. I started pursuing other things. Then I started bugging my mom, like, hey, I started becoming desperate. I became the desperate filmmaker. Thank you, Robert. <laughs> the desperate filmmaker. I was like, my right? mom, I told my mom, yeah, I gotta, I, I gotta buy that camera. That camera that I saw Robert with, yeah, that, that Canon A1 high A camera with the nasty lens. Yeah, I find out later, that's not the camera he made the movie with. Right, right, yeah. But I insisted I had to have that camera. That camera was expensive. That camera was, at the time, it was $1,800. Wow. And that was a lot of money back then. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. my mom, she had good credit because she was a police officer. Right. And so she put it on her credit card and wow. got me the camera because I would not leave her alone about it. <laughs> she you was know? like, here, finally, get, get off came. my back. She caved in, you know. <laughs> and then years later, the book came out. And right. so a lot of the stuff that I could have learned from the book, I already learned. But since you, you I kind learned of, you it, kind of actually since <laughs> rewrote I, it in your own way, you know. So since I learned what you know he's putting in the book, mm -hmm. you know the lessons he gave in the book yeah. on my own, I felt like, oh, okay, we kind of like, you know, um, we're kind of on. On the, yeah, thinking. like thinking in, in the same way as far as like how to creatively resolve things. I didn't have money, so mm -hmm. I had to figure out how to make movies with things I could borrow, things I could steal, right? Or, mm -hmm. or you know, places that I had access to. And sure. if I didn't have access to it, then, you know, I had to go there and pitch myself like, hey, I'd like to use your place to, to shoot a scene for a movie. And I usually would right. go in there with that nasty ass can and wrapped around my neck. <laughs> when they see that camera, I'm like, right, oh, this guy, this guy's a for real. He's a sure. professional <laughs> gives, cameraman. Gives you a little clout when you got that big thank God camera. That hanging camera around your neck. Thank God that camera had the auto feature. I'd put it on automatic because that car was way. The camera was way smarter than me as far as <laughs> <laughs> how I should adjust it, you know. But then little by little, yeah. little by little, I start to learn those features too. And I still, I'm not that good. Sure, I'm sure. I'm still learning how to set exposures and stuff on the cameras. And that's why I'm here at the studio because I taught myself a lot of this stuff. And now I want to be like formally, you know, trained on mm -hmm. all these technical things because you cannot just be creative. You have to be creative and technical if you want to achieve some of the things or the level that Robert achieved, okay? 
And so that's where I'm at now. Yeah, I think that's an important part of, uh, of the book is, yes, he's a very creative person, but he also learned the skills, either, you know, just figuring it out himself, you know, maybe going to UT film school for a little while. Might have learned a little bit there. No, he, he was he's really <laughs> smart. He figured out a lot of things on his own. Yeah, I think he's, he's just smart. Some people are just smart like that, you know? Yeah, I think he just he, he blew up at the, 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 the right time, you know? I mean, there was independent filmmaking was, was coming into its own at that point in time. Cause yep. you, had, you had Richard Linklater, you had him, you had uh, um, uh, Kevin Smith, uh, Tarantino. They all blew up right around the same time. Okay, so the first time I came, it's funny you say that, the first time I came to... Um, to Austin, I came to Austin to see if I could find like an office or something for Robert, because mm -hmm. I wanted I wanted to work for him. I would have I would have worked for free. Oh, you wanted was, to find out where where his offices were? Okay. Oh yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I figure if he lives in Austin, he must have an office. You know, Makes sense. when you read the book, right? You read the book, right? So you know how he went to L.A. and he just started going to distributors and talking to the owners of the distributors. He, he went did. to the agency and like, hey, yeah, I was told to stop by here and drop off a copy of my, my movie. And so delusional me in my head, I'm thinking like, oh, yeah, that's, that's what I need to do. I need to go to, to Austin and I need to just, you know, show how determined I am, right? Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. I'm willing to go all the way from Philadelphia to Austin to try and, and, and like pitch myself pitch to him. Pitch yourself to Robert, yeah. Because I didn't want to be in his movies, okay? Mm -hmm. I didn't even need to be friends with him or anything like that. I just wanted an opportunity to be on the set, kind of like what he had with um, From Water to Chocolate. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that, that movie was shot up, but... in, a, in Acuna, Mexico, uh -huh. right before he was going to do El Mariachi. Mm-hmm. And he had already done a bunch of little movies there with Carlos, you know? Right. So it's Carlos got stuff. picked up to be like a PA or something uh, in the movie. Right. And so he invited Robert down and he told him, hey, come on down, bring your camera. I'm going to introduce you right. to the directors and whatnot. Well, well, that's the thing. He had the hookup through Carlos yes. a, as an end to, to meet all these cool people exactly he didn't just show up there and say hey can i come and shoot some footage on the set right you know so yeah so yeah. he had he had that you know that's what i wanted mm -hmm. when i when i came to austin i was like i want to be a behind the scenes cameraman that was my goal right. i figured being the behind the scenes cameraman i could learn so much by just filming this guy in action, you know? Yeah, that's true. They need to be friends. I could be a fly in the wall, you know? <laughs> okay. Quiet, won't disrupt the scene or anything like that. Right. You know, I could make connections, which I did. When I came, I did extra work, and some of the extras that I met on the set, I wind up, you know, organizing them and shooting like we did Austin Strangler and... Mm, mm -hmm really didn't do anything else right but anyway let's conclude this uh podcast uh we've been rambling on long enough uh but it's a yeah good, so it's... i just wanted to do this episode of mm -hmm. our of our podcast on the mastery uh the rebel and uh, yeah i want to pitch this i hope somehow he can see this and and you know take me up on on my suggestion of oh making this into a series i think it would be um maybe even like an award-winning series on his channel if he even cares about winning any kind of awards like that but i think he's got it right here this is the most inspirational it would be the most inspirational mini series for filmmakers not just latinos anyone uh -huh. I would agree with that. So on that note, we're going to end this podcast. Mark, thanks for coming. All right. Thanks okay. for having me. And Ben, thanks for working the equipment, the control. So tune in for our next episode. We're going to be talking about my, my last project that I tried to do here with a little GoPro. It's called God Shock. And we'll be showing some clips of that and talking about what the hell I was thinking about when I did that. So <laughs> until then, have a nice day. Yeah. <laughs>